uh, summer visiting students I have this year. Uh, and, and I really watched Zhiping from junior faculty back in early 20, 2000, all the way to the leader of the field. She has been uh, involved, participating, and leading uh, international efforts on genomics, including this, uh, she will tell us about this ENCODE program, which has uh, had a major impact on our understanding of gene regulations, and nowadays about the cancers, about the various disease as well. Okay, without further ado, I will give the speaker to GP. Okay, do I sound a little better? That sounds good. Good, thank you. Um, so um, the topic of my talk is about registry of candidates as regulatory elements for the human and mouse genomes. Um, so just to get started, um, one motivation is that if you look at um, our genomes, um, human and mouse genomes, and a very small portion of the genome codes for the exons of proteins. And uh, the vast majority of the genome is not coding, indicated by this gray area. Um, it has all kinds of good stuff in it. Um, but the thing I'm going to focus today is regulatory elements. So why do we really care about regulatory elements in addition to coding exons. Um, this is because um, basically this sentence written right here, um, if you look at the different cell types in the human body, in any metazoan's body, um, they all have pretty much the same genome. But obviously they have different phenotypes and the different functions. Your skin cells and your heart cells wouldn't be able to do the same thing um, if they have exactly the same genome but no regulation. So the whole point is that um, the regulatory elements in our genome can control the expression of a distinct set of genes in each cell type, which conveys the phenotype and the function. So it's so important to understand these uh, regulatory elements um, so I'm going to give a little bit of uh, intro into what they are. Um, the main four types here indicated by color. So in red has the promoter element, which is very close to the transcription start site of a gene. The gene will be made into a transcript, which is an RNA, and then later on become protein molecules, which will carry on all kinds of functions in the cell. Um, the promoter is this bit of DNA that's very close to the transcription start site of a gene. Um, that's one major class of regulatory elements. And another one uh, which we will focus a lot today is the enhancer. Enhancer, as the name implies, it enhances the function of promoters. So basically, it's uh, like a remote control at a distance from the gene and enhances the function of promoters to turn the genes on. And there are additional types. Um, I think I have some animation, but it moves really fast. Okay, so um, additional types such as silencer, repressor, which does pretty much the opposite of enhancers. It represses transcription. And there is um, this other class which is very important is because our genome is like a linear very long molecule, actually uh, chromosomes, like a, a few dozen very long molecules. Um, all these regulatory elements need to be demarcated in the genome so that they don't talk to the inappropriate genes. Um, insulators are those elements that precisely convey this function. They block the interactions between enhancers and uh, inappropriate genes, between silencers and inappropriate genes. So these are the major classes of them. And uh, um, obviously, genes are really important. If you have genes that have mutations, it, it's very common you might get diseases from genetic mutations. Um, but in addition to genes, these regulatory elements are also very important. If you have mutations in regulatory elements, you may also get diseases. Um, they are not as frequent as mutations in genes because the many regulatory elements regulate one gene. So there is a many to one relationship. So individual regulatory elements tend to have lesser effect than genes. 
Nonetheless, there are um, very well-known examples. Uh, I have listed a few of them here that mutations in regulatory elements can result in very uh, drastic diseases, such as uh, polydactyly, which is a disease that you have more fingers than you should, or fewer, uh, cleft, cleft platelet, and uh, congenital heart defects. So um, obviously, you know, if you look at mutations in the vast spans of the genome, it's going to be looking for needles in a haystack. However, um, if you only focus on um, the uh, regulatory regions, you can, it's a very small portion of the genome, but more than 80% of the non-coding genetic variants associated with human diseases lie in non-coding regions of the genome. Um, they are very much focused in regulatory elements. And that is why we want to annotate regulatory elements and understand their function so that we can focus our effort of understanding diseases that are associated with non-coding genetic variants. And later on, we'll give an example of um, specific diseases in non-coding regions. So, um, okay, so um, the reason um, like we spend so much effort um, in, in this project is because we are part of a very large consortium with roughly 500 members. Um, it's called the ENCODE Consortium, stands for the en Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. Um, so there is a picture here with, um, I think I, I am pressing the wrong button here. Um, so um, the picture here um, indicates that um, roughly um, uh, half of the members in the consortium at that time, this is one of the consortium meetings. Um, the goals of the ENCODE consortium, it, it's very much like a resource generating consortium. The goal is to catalog all the functional elements, including genes and regulatory elements in the human and the mouse genomes. And uh, it's developing freely available resources for the research community. Um, the project contains um, data generation, data analysis, and uh, data repository. Um, my lab's uh, participation in the project is mainly in data analysis. So, um, so let's zoom in a little bit um, in terms of uh, enhancers. So um, if you look at the enhancer in terms of a chromatin, chromatin is um, the thing that's a DNA protein complex. You know, we have uh, autosomes, chromosomes, um, sex chromosomes, and autosomes, and they are complexes of a very long DNA along with histone proteins. So it's a protein DNA complex. So um, it's also bound by other proteins. Um, here, we depict a few of them here. These are control proteins called the transcription factors, uh, in short, TFs. Um, they actually bind to these uh, regulatory elements inside enhancers to turn the genes on and off. Um, so um, you can um, assay um, these kind of data in specific cell types using biotechnology um, that, in, that involves, um, a lot of it in, involves immunoprecipitation. Uh, the name immunoprecipitation just means it uses antibody, immune precipitation. Um, so you have these Y-shaped antibody molecules that can recognize transcription factors that bind to enhancers to indicate where the enhancers are, okay? So um, the ENCODE consortium has generated um, chromatin immunoprecipitation uh, followed by deep sequencing, ChIP-seq data uh, for uh, thousands of experiments. So these are, this, this effort is ongoing, and uh, um, the data we have used here include thousands of experiments, but in total, the ENCODE consortium has generated close to 15,000 data sets that are genome-wide, in 90% of them in humans, and uh, roughly 10% in mouse. Okay, um, in addition to looking at where the regulatory transcription factors could bind in the genome, um, you, can, um, you can also use the same technique, um, in, uh, but instead looking at um, histone proteins. So the histone proteins have these N-terminus tails that are decorated by many um, post-translational modifications, such as acetylations, um, modif uh, histone mod um, 
methylations, um, all kinds of uh, modifications, hundreds of them. And they are like landmarks in the genome to indicate what a piece of DNA is doing. So you can do that uh, for uh, ChIP-seq, for histone modifications. We also have uh, thousands of experiments. Um, so they, they, um, they really show up, like uh, if you array your data on the one-dimensional linear genome, they show up like um, these kind of tracks. And also, um, there is also one other technique um, that uses an uh, endonuclease DNAs, which is an enzyme that cuts DNA. Um, so this enzyme uh, cuts DNA if the DNA is freely accessible. So if you have regulatory regions in the genome that is not bound up by histone proteins, um, so if it's accessible, then the DNA's enzyme will go in and make, make cuts and then release unbound DNA. And then you can sequence the unbound DNA. And uh, you can see DNA's cleave uh, open chromatin and makes a signal to show this region of the genome is uh, open chromatin. Okay. So uh, uh, for each of the data set, you basically can get this kind of uh, one-dimensional linear signal across the entire genome. Um, they, um, they look quite, quite interesting. And if you, um, if you have a particular cell type, you can get different assays on the same cell type. And when you have different cell types, you can compare your uh, data across different cell types. Okay, so here is an array of the data, uh, different assays on the same cell type at a particular uh, gene locus. So SP1 itself is also a transcription factor. Um, as shown here, with its axons and introns, um, it's a quite a typical looking gene. So at the five prime end of this gene, you can see these very striking looking um, signal peaks coming from DNA signal indicating, um, so all my slides are color coded. So if you see DNA, which is um, open chromatin and uh, it's in green, um, if you have this particular histone mark uh, histone 3, lysine 4, trimethylation, which is in red. Um, this is a promoter mark. So it spikes um, uh, very uh, significantly near the, the beginning of a gene. And then there is another H3K27AC, which is an enhancer mark. It's always going to be in yellow in my slides. And it shows up very strongly at enhancers. And it also shows up at promoters because in some ways, promoters are kind of like enhancers themselves. Um, very often you also have a promoter proximal enhancers near the promoters. So they show up also here. So you can see that um, it's, this kind of signals are, they flare up at very specific locations in the genome and they're not like noise smeared around, right? You really can see there is some kind of signal going on. Um, CTCF, is uh, one of the insulator, uh, it's actually the only known mammalian insulator binding protein, in, in, always in uh, blue in my slides. Um, this is um, the one that's demarcating the genomic boundaries between enhancers and uh, promoters. So typically, if you would have a CTCF um, stuck in between an enhancer and the promoter, it will prevent the communication between the enhancer and the promoter. So it's also a very important mark. Okay, um, so um, there are um, many um, computational methods, some fancier than others, for predicting regulatory elements. Uh, many of them like machine learning, um, supervised, non-supervised, uh, many available, and ENCODE members are authors of several of these kind of algorithms. Uh, such as Chrome HMM um, by Manolis Kellis, uh, Segway by uh, Bill Noble, um, RFX um, by Bing Ren, um, all these um, different algorithms. And they typically require many experiments to be done on the same cell type. Okay, so as a resource, um, my lab came in, uh, we want to uh, develop a method that can annotate regulatory elements that can be applied to as many cell types as possible. Um, so when you have many cell types, they do not typically um, get covered by all the assays required. So we come up with a very simple approach that we will, I will tell you about today. 
So here is like the data matrix showing available data. Um, each row is um, a tissue type, and the columns are assays. As you can see, that um, this is a, can be a very sparse matrix, especially if you go to um, the less uh, studied cell types. Okay, so, um, so basically our approach um, starts with um, open chromatin regions, because open chromatin regions um, are rather non-discriminant in terms of what kinds of regulatory element you're looking at because all kinds of regulatory elements need to have the DNA being available to function as whatever regulatory elements you may have. So um, they will be open chromatin. So you can see that um, every row here is a biosample, and uh, um, the peaks you see, there are many rows here, dozens of them, um, the peaks you see are regions in the genome that are open chromatin. Um, some regions are very open in every single cell type, some are less so. And uh, um, these um, regions I, I outlined in red are more ubiquitous. And uh, these other regions tend to be more cell type specific. And uh, um, however, um, we can represent um, all these activities using a representative list of um, DNA's hypersensitive sites. So these you know, you have all these many, um, for each one of them, we can pick a representation. We call them RDHSs. Um, DHS is a pretty commonly used term in genomics, stands for DNA's hypersensitivity sites. So as you can see at the bottom, I always like seem to press it twice. Um, I'm sorry about this. Um, so you can see at the bottom, um, these are the RDHS sites. So for every location you see some signal in one of the cell types, we will pick a representation here. So throughout the genome, you don't have to look at every base in the genome, but instead you could look at these um, pretty punctate regions that we denote as RDHSs. So in total, um, we have curated 2.2 million such regions in humans. So uh, this GRCH38 is just a very esoteric term for the current version of the human genome. Um, and likely M MM10 is the current version of the mouse genome. So we have like in the millions of such regions in the genome have picked out uh, that have open chromatin activity. And then we can go back and use those regions and layer on these three other types of um, other epigenetic signals um, you know, I told you before, there are hundreds of them, but luckily, I'm not going to go through all of them. All we use are these three. If you can remember, red stands for promoter, H3K4 and E3. Yellow stands for uh, enhancer, H3K27AC. And then blue stands for insulator, which is, is CTCF. So you could, if you can remember these three types with their appropriate colors, then that will be enough for today. Okay, so um, we go from uh, DHSs um, by layering on additional data type, these three data types, and uh, promote um, those RDHSs that are further supported by these additional cell, uh, data types to cis, uh, candidate cis regulatory elements, so CCREs. I apologize for the acronyms. Um, um, I don't know if this is funny or not, but being part of a consortium, um, a lot of people vote on things. And uh, we actually have changed the names of our regulatory elements many times. And at the end, we end up with CCREs. Um, so, um, so it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's going to be very difficult to change it. So at the end, we have uh, roughly a million such CCREs, um, which are basically regulatory elements. Okay, in humans, and 340,000 of them in mice. So um, a little bit about how they look like. So we actually do have them classified with further acronyms, such as promoter-like signatures, because um, we're not allowed to say they're promoters because they have not been tested with functional data to show that they have promoter functions. So they get stuck with another acronym, which is PLS, Again, it's red. So uh, 35,000 of them in the human genome. Um, just give you a little bit of ballpark, we have roughly 21,000 human genes 
So you can imagine each gene may have multiple starts, and uh, it's quite reasonable to have three times as, um, not three times, tw almost two times as many uh, promoter elements. Um, and the other one is um, you, you can have enhancer-like signatures, which is ELS, and sometimes they can be proximal, sometimes they can be distal to a gene. So I'm going to go a little faster now because um, I have spent a bit time on the biology. So you can see these, um, we have quite a lot of these uh, enhancer-like elements in yellow. And then you have other ones that might have poised, um, so they are not quite ready to enhance, but they are just getting ready. So um, they have some marks, but not enough marks. So these ones, there are 26 of them. And then finally, we have these um, boundary elements that are insulators, um, that are CTCF in blue, and uh, we have 57,000 of them in humans. So roughly, that's kind of the composition of what we have. So now that uh, we have um, such a collection, we call it a registry, and we can go on and classify their activities in specific cell types. That's when the fun starts. So for each cell type, for example, here I have a hepatocyte, which is a liver uh, cell. Um, and you can see that um, um, you can classify the, the, the nearly one million into different categories. Most of them are not active in that cell type, which is interesting but understandable. Only a small subset of them are actually active in each cell type. And that's why different cell types have different phenotypes and different functions. It's because the regulations are different across different cell types. And uh, you can uh, do this um, across the many um, biosamples, hundreds up to thousands of biosamples were accumulating rapidly in the encoder consortium. And you can see that in neurons, they have very different peaks and hence different annotated CCREs from hepatocytes I mentioned earlier. Um, so um, um, these um, CCREs, um, we actually accession them, um, just like we would accession genes. And when the genome version goes from uh, an older to a newer version, such as um, HG19 was the previous version, and the current version is uh, HG38, very similar to GRCH38 with minute differences, depends on who is preparing them. Um, so we actually accession them very differently from, uh, I mean, specifically from, from 37 to 38. And then mouse, we also from 10, the next version will be 11. So that every time when we change, you can always trace back to the previous versions of the same element. So, um, so we, actually, we, in addition to having the registry, we have also spent a lot of effort developing a visualization tool, which is web-based called a screen. And you can, uh, anybody can use it for data visualization. So, um, does it work? It's supposed to be a movie. Um, maybe, in, um, what happened to my first screen? Okay, something is moving, okay. Um, so you can see that um, this is the website. And if you go in, each one of these is a, a CCRE and it has all these signals in a tabular format. And uh, the, the, the advantage of our registry is it's cell type specific. So you can search specific cell types. And once you get into a cell type, you pick, for example, this cardiac um, fibroblast, and then all the corresponding data will be specific to that cell type. They will cut over, and then you can search them, and uh, you can um, filter them using whatever category uh, of data you, you, you most care about. And then um, you can uh, look at um, the genes near them and the expression of the gene. Um, the genes, you can um, pick different kinds of uh, experiments to assay the expression of the gene. Um, you can sort them by experiment, sort them by tissue. Um, there are additional uh, expression-related um, data and co-producers, such as Rampage, which is an assay that characterizes the activity of, the, um, of each transcript. So, um, this resource is available um, online and uh, um, um, at the ENCODE uh, portal homepage if you want to give it a try. Um, so, um, so additional highlights I just want to point out that if you go into um, each element, 
you see this is an accession to CCIE, and you can see that um, it has all different kinds of scores and whether or not it has what kind of signature it has and all that. Um, and uh, um, we can overlap the ENCODE data with um, other ENCODE data that we have not used to build the registry. For example, um, uh, uh, the transcription factor uh, TF, central transcription factor, as I said earlier, there are many of them, roughly 1,500 of them encoded in our genome. Um, a few hundred of them have been assayed by ENCODE, and we have additional data, and we can overlay all these additional data and additional histone marks um, beyond those two I mentioned. There are dozens of them also, and the data available, all of them link into the registry. Um, gene expression, I mentioned this earlier. You have seen this kind of bar graph to indicate gene expression levels. And uh, we also um, incorporate the experiments um, that will link these regulatory elements with their target genes. So these regulatory elements are far away from genes. Um, it would be great if we could find out which genes they regulate. Um, so we have um, incorporated into screen these um, both ENCODE data and external data with four shown here um, using a quantitative trait loci. This is basically a simple regression between gene expression and the genotype. And also this is just a fancier version of the previous one in single cells, if you care to know. And these are actually uh, biophysical experiments to measure which chromatin pieces are in high contact in the cell and then link them together and sequence them. So different varieties of them um, that will possibly give insight to which target genes each CCRE could regulate. And uh, all these data that we have are incorporated into screen. So you can see that for each CCRE, um, what kind of um, data is available to reveal its uh, target gene. And ENCODE is a pretty big consortium, so there are people working on um, experiments to validate some of these elements. Um, so um, we, um, we, we have uh, eight centers doing this kind of experiment. Um, this, um, this is actually data outside ENCODE we can also use. So basically, there are all these elements you want to have some kind of validation. So um, this is a high throughput technique from um, Bas van Stensel's lab, Stensel's lab. Um, this is more like a promoter activity you see here, um, genome-wide promoter activity in human cells. So you can see these different flavors of CCREs I mentioned before. Um, if you take the total genome, um, the percentage that will validate by this assay is very small because a very small portion of the genome is actually functional in terms of regulation. If you take all of the CCREs without cell type specificity, then it's increased but by threefold possibly. And if you go to the specific cell type, so this is uh, the same cell type as the experiment. This is a red blood cell derived cell line, K562. And you see the, the percentage that's validated substantially increase. And when you go into the specific categories, if you can still remember, PLS is promoter-like elements. So the promoter-like elements has the highest validation rate because this assay is a promoter assay. So on and so forth, we can um, combine all these external data. And uh, for example, this is actually an internal data. This is from um, uh, uh, Len Pernacchio's lab. Um, for, um, these, these are transgenic mouse assays, uh, lower throughput, but very um, accurate. So you take a mouse embryo, you can inject a piece of DNA, uh, presumably our predicted regulatory elements in it, with a reporter so that when you see, say, a blue stain, this is um, like Z gene, that's a staining, um, blue indicates where this piece of DNA has a regulatory function. So here indicates it's the heart, and that's the forebrain, and those are the limbs. The mouse looks like a little boxer. So um, 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 we actually have data, we have tested. This is one of the regions that we tested using CCIE, and it turned out to be uh, correct in, in limb. So just for the few, last few, um, okay, so this is a higher, higher, these are additional, sorry. I'm not very good at this remote. I apologize. Um, so um, these are additional um, examples that we have validated 
um, using our CCRE, uh, CCREs with enhancer activity. Um, we validated uh, close to 100 of them. There was a panel that flew by because every time I click, it seems to double click. Um, in any case, um, so, so we validated uh, roughly 100 of them and uh, um, um, the higher signal, the higher validation rate. So in the last few minutes, um, let me just give uh, one specific example of a disease. Um, so schizophrenia is a, a highly de debilitating disease um, and uh, um, it's, it's uh, the understanding of which regions in the genome, which variants cause schizophrenia, um, it's, it's very poorly understood. So two studies here um, associate a particular variant um, that's non-coding with schizophrenia. Um, this is a region in the genome. Um, it's a gene called A-GAP1. It's in the intron of this particular gene. And this gene is not known to be in, implicated in schizophrenia. So um, this um, single nucleotide polymorphism, I, I said a variant or SNP, uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, they are the same thing. Just one base in the genome that has been changed or differ between individuals. So this SNP, it's associated with schizophrenia, and uh, it does not overlap a CCRE. Okay, so my promise earlier for focusing on CCRE um, didn't pan out right away. Um, however, instead of uh, the CCRE itself, um, so um, um, I don't know how easy to, is it, it is to explain linkage disequilibrium. So um, there are recombination hotspots in our genome. So when parents' uh, chromosomes cross over, recombine, they don't, re re they don't recombine evenly across all positions in the chromosome. The, some regions of the chromosome, they, um, they like to stick to each other, pass on to the next generations in very high frequency. And these regions are called in linkage disequilibrium. Okay, so um, if you look at the region that's in, in linkage disequilibrium with this SNP, and you see that there are six, it's a, these that, like big swaths, big chunks of the regions. And they tend to be inherited simultaneously. So there are six CCREs that are in LD with this SNP. So that gives us what to look at. Um, and if you look at these CCREs, we have data to see whether or not they are active in different cell types. That's when our, the power of our resource comes in. Only one of the CCRE is actually active in human brain. The others are not active in the brain. So this is presumably schizophrenia is a brain disease, right? You would want to look at a regulatory element that's specifically functional in the brain. Um, so this brain region, and brain is actually a difficult cell type. Um, so if you look at the brain, um, we have um, all these samples. Okay, <laughs> something happened. So all these samples for human brain, we have data available, and you can see that a 56-day fetal brain has this uh, open competence signal, okay? Um, however, uh, we don't have a lot of data for human brains because, um, especially fetal brains, because um, these samples are very precious and difficult to uh, obtain, and the NIH has recently even passed an embargo, and you're not supposed to use more fetal brain tissues. Um, so ENCODE has mouse data available, and there is a very um, nice panel of fetal mouse tissue um, with all kinds of data. So we leverage the orthology between human and mouse, and look at this region. It has an orthologous region also in the mouse. It's also a CCRE in the mouse. It has data in C, um, uh, uh, open chromatin data. And in addition, very good, it has this enhancer H3K27AC um, experiment across the entire trajectory of developmental time points during uh, embryonic day 10.5 to embryonic day 16.5. And you can see there is activity of these um, CCRE um, in, the, in the middle, roughly at 12.5 uh, time point. So um, we actually further did experiments with Len Panacchio's lab to test this region in a mouse. And you can see that um, the, um, the, region, the region we test is uh, it's like a bigger region here. And uh, it's uh, functional 
and you can see it lights up with legacy stain in mouse brain. And then if you knock in the SNP, the variant that's associated with the schizophrenia, um, they have some kind of elaborate scheme to score, and the variant leads to decreased function of the element. Okay, so um, basically that's kind of a very short example to show that how individual researchers with this kind of biological data can come in and uh, use our resource and try to drill down to um, more specific cell type specific data and use the data to guide their experiments. So let me just finally summarize. Um, we have integrated thousands of epigenomic data sets to annotate almost one million candidates this regulatory elements in the human genome, and roughly 340,000 of them in the mouse genome. We have validated these uh, predictions with both published functional data and by performing transgenic mouse enhancer assays ourselves with collaborators. Um, CCREs can be used, as you see in the schizophrenia example, to help generate hypotheses for many different kinds of biological problems, including annotating disease-associated genetic variation. And uh, in the future, um, so we, uh, we are also a part of a, a psychiatric ENCODE consortium. So we are in the process of incorporating, um, increase the registry's coverage by incorporating other data from PsychEncode, from, for example, Blueprint, from other uh, public data available in the Gene Expression Omnibus, uh, which is a public resource. And uh, we are um, in the process of defining new categories of CCREs, um, such as the repressive kinds that you have now heard me talking about, silencers, repressors, other different kinds, um, fine drilling down to specific um, enhancers and specific promoters. So ah, this one we have to go back. So all the work, um, most of the work that uh, I present today are done uh, by three very talented individuals. Um, Jill Moore um, was a PhD student in my lab. Um, now uh, she has uh, stayed on to be the project manager of the ENCODE Data Analysis Center, which I, I'm directing. Um, these two, um, Michael and Henry, um, are MD PhD students. I'm at UMass Medical School, so we actually get these kind of people, very rare people, and they, um, they are kind of, um, um, I don't want to say misfit, but they, they, they are atypical for a medical school because they come in, they, they, don't, they don't do experiments. They are literally computer geeks. So um, they joined my lab, and uh, um, they, both of them have been uh, instrumental in building the screen resource and other kinds of algorithms we are using that I didn't go into details about. So thank you for your attention. So, any questions? We have time for a few questions. Wow. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. This is cool. I didn't yeah. even realize what that was. Uh, so, Chiping, why do you require the DNA? Uh, of course, that there, there needs to be a DNA speed, but one of the three other one. If it's only a DNA speed without any of the other. Do not believe that it's a real factor by you? Well, um, we kind of looked into it. Um, for example, I, in the future directions, I talked about other kinds of CCREs, um, possibly silencers, repressors. And um, for a while, we thought the ones uh, that are DHS, but do not have the other three um, elements. Um, are actually repressors or silencers. And uh, we tried really hard. We, we couldn't be sure. So um, for the time being, we have left them out. But in the future, we're in the process to see whether or not we can gain additional data to support they are actually functional in some way. Like the lack of signal is not good enough for us. We have to have another backup signal to show their repressors or silencers. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> um, yeah, it's fun to listen to your uh, presentation. And I'm very interested in this uh, CCRE, this uh, regulatory elements, right? And you, 
you already identify them in both human and mouse genome. Um, I'm interested in how many of these CCR are conserved in human mouse. Are there any specific features? Yeah, um, so quite a bit of them are conserved. So um, I would say because mouse has 340,000, so I would say roughly 200,000 of the 340,000, I have to look carefully, but roughly that order of magnitude are also in humans. Um, obviously, the portion will be smaller among humans because the mouse one is, is not yet complete. The reason the mouse has a fewer number of them is because we don't have enough uh, data to annotate the mouse. It's not because uh, they indeed have fewer. We expect the mouse to have roughly the same, the same number as in humans. So roughly speaking, it's like a third and a third and a third. A third is species specific. A third is conserved, but not classified as regulatory elements. And then a third is conserved and also regulatory. Okay, let's thank uh, Thank you so much.